pleased to see a lot of new faces here tonight. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many, for how many people is this your first Global Portland meeting? All right, a lot of people. All right, so um, we're going to go through a few pieces of agenda, um, and then we'll get right into the panel, so it won't take very long. Um, so we already did the networking and introductions. We're going to talk about some upcoming events and announcements. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk about what Global Portland is. So um, we are a local group of volunteers who organize these events. What is that noise? Crickets. Crickets? Oh, From that. Laptop. This um, is the webcast. <laughs> so currently, there's, there's nobody in this room, so it's all crickets. Um, <laughs> Despite, despite what you may see. Um, so actually, before I forget, I want to actually thank Seth, because he's been streaming this, he's been recording the video for these meetings uh, for the last few months, and I just want to give him a hand of applause. Really great. Um, and I think he actually put the crickets in place so that I would acknowledge. <laughs> Um, so we meet on a monthly basis to talk about mobile topics on a variety of different issues. So we either talk about, um, like last month we had somebody from Palm talking about mobile um, and their phones. Uh, the month before that we had people talking about strategy. So it's a variety of different topics, which means that we have a lot of different um, people come, depending on what it is. Um, it's based off of a international organization called Mobile Mondays, um, which has been doing this for quite some time. Um, so I hope, you know, even if you're in education and that's your main interest in tonight's meetings, that there might be stuff in the future that you find interesting. Um, you can sign up for announcements for future meetings at mobileportland.com. Um, and I want to thank everybody who actually helps put this on. So Urban Airship and Portland Incubator Experiment um, allow us to have the space. Um, my co-founders and co-workers at Cloud4 buy the food. Hi buys the beer, and then the rest of it's just sort of volunteer efforts from the steering committee. Um, for those who are in mobile, um, there are some upcoming events uh, that I wanted to highlight real quick. Um, there's an event in Seattle that's got a lot of um, executives talking about mobile, um, mobile future forward. It's being organized by, um, um, oh god, I forgot his name. Um, but he's actually a really brilliant analyst, yeah. so you should look him up. <laughs> uh, and uh, Mobilize is an attempt to go design for mobile. Um, he's going on in Chicago in the third week of September. And um, I have 10 uh, codes because I'm speaking there for people who want to get 25% off. Um, and I'm assuming that Corey probably has some codes as well because he's seen goes to New York. <laughs> yes. So if you're interested in attending that conference, uh, which is Probably the only conference, it's the only conference that I know of in the United States that's focused on mobile design. Um, I, I really recommend it. Uh, organized by Barbara Ballard, who is um, really a genius when it comes to mobile development, yeah. mobile design. And then CITA, or CTIA, um, that actually says CTIA, not what it actually says, um, in October. Um, so something we've been doing in the past has been just asking people to either raise their hand or shout out real quickly if there are any job announcements or things that they have that are mobile specific. Is anyone is anyone hiring or those sorts of things? Yeah, it's education related. Crowds, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, okay. I'm not hiring, but I'm available for hire. Okay. <laughs> Small society, any iOS seasoned Cocoa developers um, should come find me after. And we're also looking for uh, QA resources. Um, and if you have mobile specific um, experience, that would be excellent. 
I'm Kale, I'm from Concentric Sky in Eugene, and we're uh, looking for mobile devs on the iPhone side. Okay. All right. So those are the people to go talk to um, if you are looking for work or if you know somebody who's looking for work. Um, so I'm, I'm so incredibly excited about this topic because um, mobile as a computing platform, something that can actually um, impact uh, education is something that I've been very interested in for quite some time. Um, it is something that you see a lot of use in um, developing countries. Um, I was reading, I think it was on the BBC, although this is actually a Vancouver Sun version of the article, um, recently about deaf children being able to communicate with their classmates because they were able to use mobile phones. Um, Nicholas Negroponte with MIT had this whole program around having one laptop per child. And I think that it's much more likely, I think that it's actually categorically true that we're going to have one mobile phone per child long before we have one laptop per child. So how do we, how do we actually use those devices in education? How do, we, how do they impact us? What do they do that's beneficial? What are the, what are the negative impacts of that? And I'm excited because I know nothing about this topic other than the few articles that I've read to get an opportunity to hear from people who are actually executing on that vision. Um, I'm also really pleased to have Thor uh, Pritchard here to do to moderate the panel. Thor works for Clarity Innovations, is that correct? Um, which does a lot of um, work with education to help them implement technology in their business or in their um, in the schools. Figure out how to use that. Um, and Thor is actually somebody who's been attending Mobile Portland for quite some time. So he's not only somebody who's got an education interest, but also has a mobile interest. So Thor, thank you very much. And uh, I'll turn it over to Thorne. Great. Thank you, Jason. I'm going to take my place in my designated stool. Um, yeah, this is obviously a topic that's been of interest to me for several years and for Clarity Innovations, which is a lot of R&D about technologies that in three to five years or longer might get to education. Uh, and mobile has always been a dream in education, as you all know. Uh, we've all been waiting for that to happen. And I think that right now, finally, the, the whole nexus of mobile, uh, wireless, the cloud, we want to use that buzzword, is really going to make that happen. And there's a lot of different devices, obviously, on the market now that are pending and coming and plan to happen. We've all been waiting. If you're from education, you all probably remember Knowledge Navigator. How many other people remember Knowledge Navigator? Apple's video of the future about this nice little device. You fold in half and it talks to you and it tells you all about everything you ever want to know, wireless network and all the data of the web. And, you know, sort of predated all of that, uh, which was a great improvement over the speaking spell for another type of <laughs> handheld internet or wireless device in education. So nowadays we have obviously the iPad, and uh, maybe eventually we'll have some other devices on other devices like an uh, Android-based device from HP, which is rumored to come out, and obviously Windows, Mobile, Phone, 7, something is supposed to happen, and there might be devices with that. Um, but of course, the iPad, the iPhone is really, really shaking up the market. And so uh, finally, after 23 years, or 27 years, whatever it's been since 1987, we're almost ready to get there and do that. Uh, the technology might be ready, but there's still this problem of, okay, great, we got the widget, but how do we do this with teaching and learning, and what does that mean? How are you going to make that real? So we're still in the early days of that, and so for the panelists, I thought, well, let's find some folks who are doing that, uh, you know, as sort of groundbreaking, early adopters, bleeding edge, whatever metaphor you want to use for them, and see what their experiences have been, talk about what have been their successes and failures, uh, and there's some good stories there um, about other devices, i.e. the Kindle, um, and what that works and what that looks like in education. And then talk about, uh, you know, other people will talk about, um, you know, what's it look like from the development side. How do you develop apps for education uh, and not just try to reinvent the wheel and just do what I like to think of as a textbook that is now a pop-up book because it's got cool visuals. How do you go to the next step beyond that? Uh, so today with us, uh, we have here, uh, Joe Morlock, I'm going to have to slice to get the names pronounced right, who's from Camden School District. Uh, in the middle there is Corey Pressman from Xperia Media. And then the last is Trina Marmon, Marmorelli, thank you, from Reed College Instructional Designer, who has experience with the Kindle Pilot and the uh, iPod Pilot. So uh, with that, I actually was going to have each of them do like three, five minutes of just sharing what their experience has been, what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, uh, what they think the killer app is for education. Uh, and then once we've gone through each of them, then we'll open up more questions and dialogue and we'll play uh, Stump the Geek at some point tonight. <laughs> so with that, Trina, why don't you uh, tell us what your experience has been. All right. Thank you all so much for coming and thanks for inviting me for um, to be here. I have to emphasize for those of you who've been here and 
not familiar with Green College, we're a very specific environment. And so what I say may not be at all generalizable to bear in mind. Um, we're extremely conservative um, in terms of teaching and in terms of the curriculum. And um, we really, really, really love books. And so pretty much any, um,
reading all the materials on the iPad, you know, taking notes, highlighting. So far, we believe that the tools that they have available to them are going to be more useful. Um, there are applications for annotating um, PDFs, for example, that seem pretty robust and able to do a lot of things. Um, we're excited about the possibility of actually being able to have PDFs load on the device and have students be able to interact with them properly and mark them up, which is going to be a huge plus for us. And so we're sort of looking forward to seeing how that all goes. We're anticipating a few problems, like you know, the lack of a file system makes it kind of difficult to sort of get the readings onto the device in a form that you'd like and make sure that all the students have the same experience when they're trying to access the readings and just generally sort of making sure the students have their iPads configured the way that is going to be most useful for class is maybe going to be a little challenging. So we're sort of trying to work those things out. Um, and as far as sort of what we'd like to see happen, we would really like to see applications get developed in the future that make it a lot easier to interact with text on a mobile device. Because as I say, that's really the standard for us. Anything that will make the experience more like the things that we really like about reading a book and being able to write in the margins and shuffle around a bunch of things at once is going to be really, really awesome for us and something that we look forward to. It was interesting, I was asking some students what they thought would be a really good sort of mobile application to develop for someone. And the thing that people got most excited about was actually something, kind of a location-based application that would allow students who were in the library already to um, find the student who had already checked out the reserved book. <laughs> <laughs> And that actually was the, the first conversation that, that I had talking about thinking about, like, 
you know, their fingers are perfect for that keyboard. And I fumble around, I'm a little better at it now, right? But, um, you know, they can find the diagrammatical marks, they can do those kind of things. Um, and so at eight years old, they're ready to go, they, yes, they use Wikipedia, Wikitab, things like that, um, to uh, find information. They use iBlogger to get on, and they blog the responses to the research and have So we've had this as our, uh, again, our, we're going into our third year. So we have about 5,000 students, so in Oregon, it's a medium-sized district. Uh, last year, this is the 0910 uh, year, we had 50 classrooms or so with uh, iPod devices uh, and about 850 or so devices in general. So most of those were iPod Touch. We did have a couple hundred nanos that had the camera we were using for voice recording. And nine carts. So carts are usually, that's how we set them up at one to one for syncing and charging and things like that. Um, the numbers change a little bit this year. Uh, we are at least doubling our classrooms and probably more. I, I put a plus there because I don't always find out about everything. Um, which is perfectly fine. I'm okay with the organic model. Uh, but we're going from 800 and some to 1600 and something. Uh, just iPod devices. So we're adding another 800 and, I ordered 840 iPod touches and about 260 iPads. Uh, so we're going to go from, again, 9 to 28 uh, carts and classrooms, as well as we're going to iPads as well. So we're going to have about um, 260 iPads and six classrooms, uh, and then some various people that will be using them. Uh, what's interesting is we were able to find, and as a first step when you get this new tech that comes in here, uh, it's fun to go with the whiz bang G way to look at the thing. It's got a cool blinking light and a wow, shiny, shiny. Um, but very quickly we found that the device, that these devices we can use for lots of things. Um, so one of them, as you see in this picture here, we created listening stations. And so those old goofy, big old box things you wheel in with the horrible headphones and what have you. We got blueberries for style, which yes, you can find on the iTunes. Um, but we were making listening stations at the shop. I'm a little rock star, that's what call it a rock star for sharing. Um, we put the iPod Touch on the desk. It's out there full time. So they had access to everything they needed. Notice, any math features out there? Good. It's covering the, uh, sorry, it's covering the uh, uh, time tables, right? It's, it's got a calculator and everything else. I know. Um, but it was an access to the world. So, you know, in that five minutes between recess and going on to the next thing, they would come in, sit down, <coughs> concept on the board. Uh, all kids eight years old are going to Wikipedia, they're going to Wikitab, they're finding the information, they're talking about what's on it, and they have a small discussion about it, and boom, they're off to reading class. Okay, so five minutes, not wasted, five minutes of some kind of small instructional moment. They didn't have to go over and get something, no moving parts, no startup. Click, write, slide, go. Right? That was kind of the, the thing. Um, it brought them together, they worked together, they worked closely together all the time. These are not staged photos, and they look like it. There he comes with a dude in a small black jacket, and we take pictures like, oh my god, this is great, you know, they're it, working on stuff. Uh, they're working together, and they're leaning in. You know, laptops have a really good way of dividing people between that screen. I can't see you, you can't see me, even though if I'm in, I'm like, oh my god, I'm still waiting for every day. Okay? This actually brings people and makes them lean toward each other. We've got that collaborative piece uh, with the iPod Touch and the little kid, it's great. They ask us sometimes why, why we have chose iPod Touch. Well, we want to do a virtual field trip and a few other little things. Um, we want to be able to do all this stuff. We found the iPod Touch for us has been able to replace 80, 85 percent of what we do on that laptop for the most of the tasks we're talking about. We don't need all that other computing power. So I'm getting five for one on the same device I was buying before. That means I get five more classrooms. Now we have 50 percent free and reduced lunch, and so we're always thinking about you know we sound cool like yeah let's have internet for this and that. Well, guess what? At least half our kids don't have high-speed wireless or high-speed internet at home. That's just, we just know this. We know at least that for the kids. The kids who are eating ketchup for lunch because it's not going cool to be poor, or the kids who you know, have families and are migrant. So we know a lot of these kids, the only time they get to touch tech and do something meaningful with it is at school. So that's we're trying to get more and more devices out there. Um, just a couple of people ask us, you know, what are you using? Well, we actually don't prescribe that. So I have teachers, and they buy their own apps, and they, they take care of all those things. But they'll have 100 to 150 apps. I know, kind of rotate them out. Sometimes they use three apps that do some similar things because they use that at a level. Um, like, you know, Johnny likes this, and Susan likes this, and Pedro should use this one, even though they're all doing multiplication here. Uh, we do a lot of work with reading fluency, so you know, that's iTalk or Dragon, you can use those. Uh, content creation, um, we, that's what we're looking for, is more and more content creation, and then getting it out of the device so you can send it home on DVD or something else that somebody else could play. So that's Sonic Picks, I think, and Real Director. So I'm making movies with the stuff that's on there, I'm making slideshows, I'm annotating it with my voice um, on the iPads I'm called Puppet Pals, which nobody thinks of, but it's a great digital storytelling tool. Multiple characters, record the voice right on the device, send it home, and what we look for now is being able to phone the projector, of course, send it home. 
Um, little things like information exploration. My uh, four-year-old loves this. This is the not the Star Wars, the other one. It's the. Well, it's not the planet, but something like that. Someone. Yes, Star Yard. It's cru cruising around because he's a very interested in planets, right? He's almost five, right? So the planets are cool. He's going in and out and going, oh, God, going to 2346, you know, in the future and seeing the thing rotate. Um, and we're also using it in high school science class. Dictionary.com is one of our default apps we install. Why? Because a kid can look up any, any word and it'll say it to them in a native voice, right? And you think about a second grader trying to find a word in a dictionary. Think about this for a second. Let's look up the word bingo, for instance. Okay, so they have to alphabetize every single letter. B, A, B. Okay, good, I'm right there. And now what? B, A, B, 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 C, B, D, B, E, B, F, B, G, B, H, B, I. Good, B, I. I'm almost there, right? I've got three more to go. B, I, K, B, I, B, B, I, C, B, I, D. So at some point, a seven year old kid's going to go, well, I'm not going to, I don't care what it Bingo, I'll just kind of guess. But they can do it on something like that as it reduces the words that are on the screen. B, it's where every word was going to be at the beginning. I, N. And so they can get to those words more quickly. And they can do it without their buddy knowing that they don't know how to spell bingo. And they can click on the little thing, it'll say, bingo, oh, that's how you say it. You know, how do you say sycophancy? Well, I'm not sure how you spell that. Right? So those kind of things, I said, what word? That was good for you. <laughs> 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 they learned something, that's right. Sure. So everything, you know, we're doing things like course management, some notebook things, some little drawings on there. Um, we're not looking for things that use uh, require a style out. We're not going to use it ever, you know, with that. We're not gonna Hitting the keyboard because it doesn't matter either. Um, it's all on the touch on the device. And so everything we can do that way, everything that makes it easier to do touch on the device, uh, we do those. So we use a couple of those things um, access and organization. Um, so the PDF dance, that's a big one. I personally use papers, which is the one on the far right, because um, as I'm working on some other studies, it actually keeps the, uh, the resource located specific to PDFs and to who they are and organize all those things in sync with my machine. But we use Goodreader and um, I annotate vast PDF, all looking for ways to, to deliver content. Um, and then fun. Some of the most fun we're having, I'm going to show you some achievement things in a second. Some of the most fun we're having are kids playing math games. Woohoo! Okay, a math game. <laughs> we're going to go multiplication facts and we're going to go head to head. That's the multiplication one on the internet now. Multiplication battle. They love it. They go head to head, they choose somebody across the Wi Fi network and they go, 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 go. Sometimes they go so back to the math things or they're practicing those things. Um, and then something like nine gaps. Um, and then, uh, I always to say this, touch matters, so of course my wife, um, uh, holy rank, she gets to use the iPad, that's the new device, but the two-year-old and the four-year-old that photo are perfectly fine managing that thing, getting in and out of the programs that they understand, that they understand, they recognize by icon, and they manage those things all the time themselves. Okay, so, um, at that younger age, they can do it. Let me show you just a couple of quick things about achievement data. Um, on the left, you'll see iPod Touch one-to-one -one classroom, we started taking data, this is a third grade classroom for math. Um, so district-wide, Camby School District, that's how the scores were. We have a, a met, uh, nearly met, like, oh, almost there, and then um, there's on meet. That's the way the state de defines them. Um, so that was for math. That was for all students and subgroups, okay, across the board. It's just in general. So this is a third grade math score out of, actually, this is Julie Johnson's classroom. Um, looking at the next one, students with disabilities. Well, you started to read a little bit of that research about kids with autism and um, students who can't see very well. Well, guess what? The data's showing that. And we've seen this time and time again. It doesn't matter what subject area or what um, uh, age group. Uh, every single time, students with disabilities came up as the one who was making huge gains using this device. Okay. Same thing. Let's go to, I think we're now in third grade. Um, this is the migrant students, kids who don't really have a home necessarily all the time. Okay. Not necessarily homeless, but they're in and out. They're fishing, farming, and forestry. Okay. Again, huge gains. So let's just maybe that's a fluke. Let's go to fourth grade. Same thing. This is uh, Jackie Fitch's classroom. All students, uh, then you're looking at reading students with disabilities. Again, huge differences. Uh, look one more time at reading for our English language learners. Let's look at that subgroup. Guess what? Huge gains. And the English language learners got better at math. So we figured out that a lot of math instruction is in English. And you can't speak English very well, you know very well math. Okay, so all these things kind of come together. Um, Okay, that's for Sorry, oh, you want to see that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we did an Iowa Test of Basic Skills, which is a national norm test. Sixth grade math to see average kids, these 200 kids that came in, the average, uh, they were at fifth grade and fourth month level. That's how you read Iowa Test of Basic Skills. Okay? When they came in, which means some kids came in with second grade math scores or ability and it's a little bit higher. And they left one year, one school year later at the seventh grade, third month as an average across all kids, not throwing out the high level. Sixth grade math using iPod Touch every single day for that hour. Okay, 
um, significant games, just one after another. We just tested class after class. We just started to track the data and do it then. So for us, the, the, the touch is a thing that goes in the middle of the glue, and you know, Johnny's still going to eat paste. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully he doesn't get it in the home button, right? You know? But uh, other than that, it fits on the desk with everything else. You know, it's this natural device. I got scissors, I can wear glue, I got to do all those things that kids do, but I also got to reach the world. Uh, we put out a wiki, and I'll give you that. If you like to see that, we have all of our deployment things about how we deploy these 800 and some devices and the other 200 and some devices. That's all uh, available publicly. I'll put those links there. And you can reach me afterwards. And then you can solve that. Sorry. Thank you, Joe. Uh, why don't you get set Thanks. Uh, while he's doing that, Joe, real quick, can you just describe how do you manage uh, some of these 1,600 devices? Uh, crowdsource. So, so like, a couple things. Uh, number one, uh, we have an open wireless network at this point. Yeah. So we don't really deal with the wireless security team. We've been open wireless for 12 years. So just a, so come on by, Candy. Come on by. Drive in. Free Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> you got to buy coffee, though, right? So um, you got to <laughs> steal sickle pits. That's right. <laughs> you can look that one up, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, and then we, we actually have teachers manage all the technology. So we have them in these carts. We've helped them. We create what are called nested playlists with the iTunes. Content. Uh, we set up some routines for them, and then the, actually the wiki was the, the main reason why um, you have to get up. Uh, this is the escape um, Yeah, so that wiki was the primary reason that wiki was to help teachers with some tech support if they needed it. And now we have parent volunteers for managing for us. Oh, can I come in? Sure. Or I, I don't want you to cut those things out. I don't want you to update all of our iPod touches to iOS 4. What do I do? Well, Hop says, do you want to do this now or not now? Click now. <laughs> and it works. And uh, so we're, we are crowdsourcing a lot. I'm, I am concerned that we can do 1,600 of those plus the 200 and some iPads. Uh, 2,000 devices reach the same amount of laptops we have just deploying. So it's pretty big. What does it look like when we should be that many iPads? It is killer.
Uh, when the iPad came out, I was getting calls like, dude, remember that thing you were talking about, that iPod Touch? I said, what can you do with that? So now they're really starting to see some, some potential here because it is such a compelling device. The first textbooks had all of this authority. The second textbooks, um, like Jansen's History of Art, if you've ever used that book, but that represents sort of the book model that showed up in the 70s when book editions started coming out every three or four years. Content would change very slowly, but somehow importantly, so you had to buy a new book. <laughs> the books became huge. Jansen's History of Art cost $250. It's enormous. Um, and so that's sort of the, and that's kind of maxed out. I don't think those books can improve, be improved upon anymore. It's done. You can't double the size of Jansen's History of Art all of a sudden. So I had to use that transition, I'm sorry. <laughs> in there, when you get to use that. So what I've been trying to do is push them into push them, trying to partner with <laughs> in order to take their content and make educational experiences. So we have this product called Quizzer that W.W. Norton just signed up for 20 versions of Quizzer, one for each of these 20 different disciplines, where I'm just trying to convince them to, well, I have convinced them, to leverage, still feels like I'm trying, but it's so flipping hard, to leverage their existing content, they have all these quizzes, they have all these flashcards, take all that stuff and make an educational experience. It reports to Facebook and they were just bugging, like that's so cool, it's social, they feel so with it now. And so we've got them, we've got a beachhead in this space and now we can scale out and make something really futuristic with it and really what these platforms can do, we can get there from here now. But I used to show up and sell them the whole thing. We can have a device where you can do all this crazy stuff. They couldn't wrap their heads around. This they can wrap their heads around. So we're getting them into this space. Um, we're working with publishers with McGraw-Hill to make a reader that allows you to read um, overviews of chapters, to do a little annotation. Not replacing the whole book. It's for cramming on the train on the way to class. Um, it's got all the multi they have all this multimedia lying around. So let's put it all on the phone, let's put it all on the iPad, and let's contextualize it, make it searchable, and voila. And they love it because they didn't have to do anything. All of this is their only deliverable to me is an FTP address and an Excel spreadsheet which is never a spell check for some reason, even though they're public. And so you take those two things and I can make these apps for them. Um, this last one's Map Quiz, which is coming out in the fall. These are coming out in the fall. Map Quiz is coming out with Wiley and Sons. It's just a map game, and all they had to do was give us their base maps, and we were able to turn it into this thing. Eventually, we're gonna start adding poli-sci information, sociology information, history, but I couldn't sell them on that to begin with, so it's about scaling up. But you see, none of these things replace the book, because I'm not, at least right now, I'm spooked by the concept. But, and I don't think the platform's ready. I thought the Kindle DX was ready, I was really psyched. But then I got hurt the same way they did. I tried pushing it and then started to realize I couldn't do the things on it I wanted to. So at least these platforms are really good at doing other things, at being experiential. So in, in this, uh, we call it a battle, this fight, this learning experience I've had um, with the publishers, they're very interested in things being course critical. And really, I'd say I'm about to start a list of three things that I think this mobile technology needs in order to succeed in the higher ed space. And the first one is access. If something isn't accessible enough, it can't be course critical. And there's nothing more accessible than a book for college students because they have book money, even though they're really expensive, they have book money, and there's a book store, right? And there's a book culture. They know how to use the books, the teachers know how to use the books, etc. So if we can't come up with something to replace that culture of learning, there's no app store on campus. You know, there's no vetted section of apps. And not everybody has the device, but also I'm so happy these people are doing what they're doing. This is exciting. Isn't that cool? I said, isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> 200 some odd iPads. And when they have a shipping, we should show up. Baseball bats and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things we're making an app for is for anatomy. We're not making the app. We just finished a discovery process where we described the app for the client, what it could be, and it was really exciting for everybody. It's for this anatomy book, and it gives me a chance to put a baby in a presentation, which is a win, right? <laughs> Bad on the equation at the top, a baby in a minute. So this is for Essentials of Human Anatomy and Physiology, a $200 book. But people keep buying it because there's a bookstore, there's a teacher saying to buy it, everyone knows how to use books, and so they can make it course critical. Look, it even comes with a book like this. What does it come with? CD. It's a free CD. You can for that. <laughs> a $200 book, but the CD is free. Yeah. So I used to make those free CDs. Things I'm making them. 
That's not good. So they have a learning management system that goes with this, and they can call it course critical. So they're always bugging when I talk to them, where's the course criticality? So it's able, I, I can't say this, I can't make you an iPad app that's course critical. Not everybody's reading, not everyone's giving this stuff out. There are a few schools that are, we're not all can be, you know, we're not all kindergartners can be. We can't get our free technology, right? <laughs> <laughs> we should have us. Um, kindergartner in general would be groovy. So speaking of groovy, what I got these suits to do was to write this down in their notes. Now we talk about, instead of course critical, I've actually made up a phrase from McGraw Hill, of course, groovy. And there's nothing more fun than having the head of Prentice Hall at McGraw Hill Higher Education writing course groovy in his notes. But that means rather than being course critical, it's just, well, it's what? Groovy. Groovy for the course, right? It'd be good to have. But rather, let's make something that's compelling. Students could use it if they're in the course. Teachers, should they be forward thinking or no students that have it, can assign things from it. But let's aim it at the public. Let's make it more general, but then make it compelling for the class itself in the hopes that the language we have around Course Groovy is that Course Groovy will be course critical at version 7. Now, I've got them comfortable with that. It's not because then they got nervous. Well, version 2 has to be ready for the class. No, no, calm down. They kind of, we can make some money and use our content in the meantime until we can, because it's all about the bottom line, these are, these are companies, right? I feel bad saying make money all of a sudden. I'm in the Pearl District, I feel okay. <laughs> <laughs> we make money, damn it. So you can't make money, you can make money in the meantime, you can monetize your assets without being course critical, and they're becoming okay with that. So we were able to start mocking up this iPad app where you can actually dissect that cadaver app images, hundreds of images of a cadaver, and now you can dissect the cadaver in my vaporware version of this, um, using that, using that um, gesture. Isn't that cool? <laughs> All right. All right. Move the layers of the face away. It's really awesome. right. it, in my head, it's a cool app. So, the accessibility isn't there yet, but the accessibility might be coming. I went to the, well, I know it's coming, right? That's why we're all here. Hopeful, at least. Um, I went to this conference called Un the Untethered Conference in New York. It's the history of publishing. Um, is what it was about, and um, what's her name? Rebecca was there from, I can't remember the rest of her name, I don't know her well enough just to know her on a first name basis, but I forgot her name. Sarah, Sarah Rotman Epps. Know her? Nope. Smarty Pants, Sarah is. She works for Forrester Research, and she, was, she did this study where she's showing where tablets are going to be, and I think tablets are the most compelling of all of these things, especially for what you were talking about in Canby, where it's in the forward, not in the back. It allows people to come together. She's saying in 2012, tablets will outnumber e-readers. And in 2014, tablets will outnumber netbooks. And uh, when I, I cornered her afterwards and said, so who, who are these people, these 59 million people, do you think students are a large portion of that segment? She saw students as leaders in that segment because of the, uh, the, the utility of the devices and, and the plummeting prices as part of what they're thinking of in this. So the accessibility is around the corner. So if I can get textbook publishers committed now, of course, groovy, and when the accessibility comes, they'll be there. And hopefully, and this is my sort of secret evil mission, is that hopefully they won't be able to charge $200 for holes anymore. Right? Because no one's going to pay 200 bucks for an app, right? <laughs> Maybe? I don't know. I'm sorry, guys. Maybe you want to. <laughs> so, but I doubt. So I'm trying to change the culture. Um, content is the other thing. So what was the first thing? It was access. Content is so, of course, important. That's why I'm working with the textbook publishers. If I didn't need the content, I'd just do it on my own. But they've got all the content. They've got the biggest pile of pedagogical assets ever assembled. It's enormous. They have amazing stuff. But I don't think we should throw all that out. We need curated content. We need vetted content. We need to know it's good. That's what, that's what publishers do for you, right? They do some curating for you, just like any Retailer really curates what they say for Amazon, who doesn't you know, curate anything, but they curate what they have and they pass that on to you. It's vetted. And it needs to be professional. And I, I don't think it's time to just throw out having professional textbook writers and have every teacher everywhere write down what they know and share it with everyone for free. Um, and that's being discussed. There was an article about that in the Times two weeks ago. Let's have, they're calling it open source textbooks, but that's not really what it is. It's more like wiki text. But I don't think that does education a service. There are professionals who can write amazing professional stuff, and they should get paid for what they're doing. And there are teachers who don't have time to go flipping through endless uncurated stuff to find things that work. I think the textbook model of having professionals write things that's curated and vetted and you can consume those things is fine. I just think textbook publishers have been making a little too much money at it. This isn't being just being a lot. Yes. yes, very well. <laughs> I'm also looking for work. <laughs> so, the 
content should be, um, what was I talking about? What was the last thing about content? It's all right, professional and, and blah, 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 blah. It should also be pedagogically designed really well. This is after being a teacher for as long as I was. I actually have a tattoo of this on my brain. Bloom's taxonomy and all the things about this learning philosophy stuff students should be able to describe and explain after absorbing stuff. But when you go ahead and make educational apps, this has to be kept in mind. They need to be pedagogically sound. Not only that, but pedagogically engineered. And this is where books aren't as fantastic as apps can be. Books are really good at being books, but they're not necessarily good at leading educational experiences that are uh, readily accessible, accessible in the moment, intelligently accessible, where you could read a chapter, the book asks you, well, what'd you think happened? And you answer, it says, well, did you think that maybe blah, 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 blah. Books don't do that, but what does? Computers do, right? And the computer you're holding does, so it can do really interesting things. So this is what I mean by educational experiences. The content needs to be pedagogically engineered. And textbook publishers are capable of that. They have experts for that um, in, their, in, in, in their grasp, as it were. Um, and then, of course, the last thing is interaction design. The interaction design of these things needs to also be very, um, what I'm looking for, good. It needs to be very good. <laughs> <laughs> That's some fantastic, psychophantic way of saying it. Come up with it. Um, it has to be precise, it has to be good interaction design. You can't just, again, that needs to be curated, embedded, and done well. These things need to be made in such a way that they're compelling for the users to make. If your users are second graders, then you need apps that are made compellingly for second graders to use. If it's for, for um, higher education, you've got to design the apps for that. And all that focus on the student is really going to benefit the student in the end. It's really, students are going to win, and so are teachers. The whole pedagogical enterprise can win if we can get textbook publishers into this game. Um, and it kind of, one of the things on the list um, was, where do you see the place of these technologies in the classroom? When I got to thinking about it, I had trouble, because it's so early. I could see, like, our, um, our anatomy app. Would it be cool if every student in the classroom had it? The school doesn't have a cadaver, so they could be doing that together. They could be um, doing that gesture and pulling apart the cadaver together, and then they could pause and write on it together. So maybe things like that. But I don't see, ultimately, that as being the most important aspect of mobile technology here. It's more like, I don't know, it's like a paradigm shift in that before, there's the students in the classroom. And now with mobile devices, there's the students in the world and the classrooms in their hand. Like that's the drawing from the whiteboard today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also hiring a, a, a designer drawer. Um, do you get what I'm saying there? It's kind of like you, you, you can open. I don't know. College, we used to sit around and talk about all kinds. We talk about like you know rush lyrics and stuff. But one thing we talk about was like that someday there'll be the school without walls. And we really had no idea what we were talking. I'm not even sure why we were talking about it because it was. 1980 something. I don't know what we were thinking, school without walls, but now it's possible. Uh, it's like we were prophetic and say it worked. Those banana peels, if you microwave them, <laughs> <laughs> actually work. So that now you can walk around with a school in your hand. And this brings up what Jason was talking about, um, where there's this possibility now where, let's bring it back to these textbook publishers, this amazing pile of pedagogical assets they're sitting on. Not only can they you know, monetize it in the short term and then help build strong pedagogical experiences in American colleges, but they can disseminate this stuff the world over as these platforms become more ubiquitous. And they're actually extremely ubiquitous already, so they're already doing the platforms kind of way ahead of this content delivery. And that's what I'll be talking about at that Design for Mobile conference, is there a business model we can dream up that would compel content providers to, to spread their content? Okay. <laughs> I, I can't talk much faster than I am. I know I'm talking fast. Does that one go on? So, so, I think that's it actually. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. That the textbook publishers have been very resistant for business logic reasons. And for the same business logic reasons, they're now um, much more open to the idea. And I think the path to success with mobile technology and these giant content providers isn't book replacement, but creating educational experiences that are designed specifically for students, designed for pedagogy, and allow for a form of education for the student that's never been seen before, and a form of education societally that's never been seen before. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. That's awesome. You can email me there. Want to talk. And I think these slides said, correct me if I'm wrong, Chase, can we get these and put them up somewhere? Or? Would love to. Okay. <laughs> you heard the man send in your slides. Sounds like yes. <laughs> um, one question before we open up to the audience here.
here, I really want to just ask you to uh, talk about, uh, this all makes sense from the textbook side, even from the business side. What about the instructional side? And, and training, feel free to jump in here too. From the college professor, that's also uh, an agent of constant instead of an agent of change. How do you right. address the instructional use? You know, I asked the same question of the head of McGraw Hill Higher Education at that Untethered thing. And um, it was an obnoxious question when I asked it. <laughs> Not being asked of me. It's obnoxious because um, you are obnoxious. Thank you. It's obnoxious. No, it's obnoxious because um, th that's what's obnoxious about the whole business model of textbooks. It, that's what makes it a broken model in this classic sense that the end users aren't, the end consumers aren't the consumers. I don't know if there's any Marxist in here that can probably explain it better. But the professors are deciding what the students are consuming, and then the students go ahead and buy it. So there's this intermediary in there that's making the purchase decision for the students, and the students have to, have to make the purchase. So it's a matter of not convincing students who would be like, whiz bang, I've had fabulous, but they have to convince the instructors, and a lot of instructors are reticent um, to move to new platforms. So that is sort of a, an interesting problem right now. But his answer was, well, this is really popular with the uh, newer professors and with adjunct professors, of which there are many. Um, and we can come up with ways to really help adjunct professors. Those are, those are adjunct instructors are those who don't have a permanent job someplace, but drive around the state and do a really good job of teaching and get stepped on and paid nothing. They're not in the union. <laughs> 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 slave for years, so. <laughs> I think what he's hoping, what Peter Davis is hoping, is that um, if we can get these new professors into it, that'll become a way to change. And Trina, Reed, what's it like with the you know, different professors from the Kindle experience or from the iPad? I think you mentioned there's going to be one professor, but is that like a tech savvy one who's willing to try new instructional methods? Or, you know, what's, what's that like? I'd say, yeah, he's very open to trying new things, and that's sort of what I'm excited to have him being willing to try this sort of thing again. But because I think I read at least the well, A, we don't actually use that many text, but we can use a lot of trade books and there's a whole lot of secondary articles from you know academic journals. But I think if some professors have a conception of the textbooks that we do use, they are somehow they are they're controlling that experience in a way that adds value to it. So you know they're doing things like you know providing guiding the students through different sort of ways, providing additional materials, sometimes, you know, skipping parts of the with their own materials. And so they, the things that, um, Corey, you were saying that the, um, your platform would do, which I think look great, uh, I think the perception of read, at least, is that professors are already doing that. I don't know how, how much more of that they would want to have in a textbook unless they had some control over it, if that makes sense. Right. Like be able to turn on and off different chapters. Right, or even being able to author some of their own content. Right. I think that would be an amazing feature. And that you know that you say that plays into the whole idea of doing user-centered design. That because that's out there, I don't need to be in a silo just throwing stuff out there, and then professors are in a silo saying this doesn't work after it's hit market. It'd be better if companies like mine and or the publishers would sit down with y'all and figure out exactly what it is you need and make it for you. And Joe, from the K-12 perspective, how much have you seen teachers teach differently, or is it just sort of, this is a natural, inherent, oh, this is obvious, I can just use this instead of that? Well, some of it's classroom replacement. So you go from every kid having to have a globe, and a dictionary, and a thesaurus, and a uh, calculator, whatever. That's the first step. But really, the, the power comes in, this uh, Kelly Turcotte, she's a fourth grade teacher uh, at Lee Elementary, and she said to me, you know, she's, everybody's teaching the same standards, right? We all have to reach the same, whatever the, the, the standards are for performance for students. So she's starting to choose content that she's purchasing based upon how far she can extend it with an app or other apps or other content. So she has to do folk tales. Well, she's going to choose one kind of folk tale over another kind of folk tale because there are more pieces of content for which she, from which she can extend it. So I'm going to choose this book about baseball and I'm going to buy 25 copies of this because there are these three apps that go along with it. Plus, there are these two other things. Plus, I got this other radio announcement from the 1930s. Plus, I got these things. So, she's actually changed the way she's teaching, just choosing different content based upon how far she can take it. So, she's actually pre researching content and saying, Well, I have to still get her to be able to spell these words, but let me do it in a different way. So, and, and because Kate feels a little different, does that mean she's buying 25 copies with 25 iPods, touches? Or is it, I mean, how do you manage that where it's in higher ed space? Like, every day, I'm assuming you said, they're getting their iPads, and here's the recommendations, provisions that they want, and get the apps. Maybe it's a three dollar app or whatever. But in K twelve, a three dollar app for a teacher, they then do a district credit card and buy. But as your attorney, I will suggest that you read. Should I not ask this question? <laughs> so, well, actually, first of all, okay, I'll be honest with you. There's, there was 
there's no way within the iTunes store to actually sell more than one license, which shied a lot of people away, a lot of districts away from doing it. Now, just as of a week and a half ago, I think, two weeks ago, uh, and I encourage all of you to put a discount in there on all the existing program, because when we buy one, we buy 600 copies of one. Um, so it's going to be 1,200. No, 1,600. 1,600. Um, but that volume purchasing program for us was a huge boon, and for a lot of people around the country, um, districts that I speak to, they, they want to know how to do this thing. Uh, right now, we buy it once and we do these other ones. Now, we're going to actually be able to pay with a purchase order, which we like. We don't have to deal with the sales tax, which we don't have to in the state. Because everybody else does on the iTunes store, they get reimbursed, which is total totally nightmare. Um, and so, being able to get multiple codes, and so that actually, that process for us is huge. Um, that would be a nice change uh, for, for those kind of things. And then the, the content as well. You know, that's, that's where um, I, I go back and one of the, the, the issues, and you've spoken to it many times, Corey, is that that they don't ask us what we want, they just give us some crap and go, oh, this is great, we're going to use it, right? Anybody here writes in their flashcard app? Come out and teach it. <laughs> we don't really do flashcard apps, right? That was cool back in the 80s, 70s. <laughs> uh, flash dance. Right, flash dance yes. in the 80s. Right? So, but flashcard, okay, we don't need it on the flashcard, because that's not what we're doing, right? The device allows so much extension beyond the classroom, the classroom without walls, that the eight-year-old kid is now looking at pictures of Brooklyn Bridge, which they will never get to see in their lifetime. But they get to see it right here because they're reading a book about baseball in the 40s. Right? So those kind of extensions of the content to go from this one thing that we've been doing and taking it beyond. So I think that the, for us, being able to buy content in bulk and certain kind of content, and not the whole dang book, but maybe chapter two of this and chapter six of the other one, and that person out there has made this great app that does this, that has the content for curating on your own. Yeah, and, and really, that being able to pick and choose and being able to purchase it in a way that makes sense. Like, I need 30 copies of chapter two for blueberries for sale. It's about that long. Uh, whatever it was being, that's good. Yeah. Question. All right, let's get it over to the questions. Who wants to go first? Jason, he wants to go first. He so, says. Um, so before the discount publishing system, were the teachers actually buying it for the red classrooms? They would buy one and sync it to 30. Yeah. Now, <laughs> sorry developers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you that's the way it was, and that's the only because there was no method within. I'll tell you what. I think that we surprised the heck out of Apple as an education community. Oh, by the way, we're going to take this little device that's the funnest iPod ever, and we're about to transition that into the coolest computing device for 800 uh, third grade children. So I don't. They didn't have a method for that. They had this. You buy. Uh, you have your device, you put on your stuff, you take it with you, you go do your thing. They were planning on a deployment of 800 or 1,000 or 1,600. Um, I was on the phone this morning with um, an unnamed Air Force base, shall we say, from the U.S. military, asking me deployment questions about iPad deployment. And they have very specific needs. And not the only ones that want to get secure PDF transfer via a wire and have something they can do flight plans and flight plans and things like that. That's what they're working on. Right? But nobody's asking what they want, they just find out, well, I'm an I got this thing called Four Flight, that's sort of cool, but it doesn't really do this other thing. So we're very excited about the volume person program because we knew that it wasn't quite right. And it doesn't feel right to not pay developers for the work they've done. And that's the same thing with content people. It's, you know, people put a lot of effort into writing this stuff. And so for me to get one copy and distribute it 30 wide is not fair. So we're actually excited because we're not going to feel so guilty anymore. And other districts are now, um, I didn't have much guilt personally. But, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but districts across the country, and I'm not talking about one or two or three districts, we're talking about thousands of schools across the country, because of that volume purchasing program, are now going to jump in because they basically said, we're not going to do this because we can't do it the right way, or our lawyers say that we do this kind of device. There are a lot of ways around it. We've heard to do it as much as we could for purchasing, but it wouldn't even allow developers to give us other licenses to buy them around the back doors. They can just pay you for 200 of them. They can't do that. So we're very actually pleased. Uh, Jason, one quick question for you. How long do you want me to go with questions? It's um, it's 7.40. Okay. So we'll pull the audience. Like 15, 20 All right, cool. All right. Who wants to ask another question? That was the first guy up. Okay, so uh, if your district is buying apps, uh, you said uh, the teachers had like 100 to 150 apps. It blows me away. Uh, what are you going to pay for an app? Uh, it depends on the app. So we pay $189 for Pro Loco to go. Which is a, a thing that replaces the Dynavox system. Dynavox allows kids who can't speak or have never spoken in their lives to connect with people because if you can choose the words and they can say, hello, I'm having a great day today, it's a little hard for them to watch. Um, so that's 200 bucks. The Dynavox system is 5000 so I buy a $500 iPad or a $200 iPod Touch and $200 of that. Yahtzee, I can buy six or eight or ten of them. So 
but that's a special need. Sure. And then most of the time we go, the sweet spot depends on the app. So free is nice, right? Mm -hmm. But um, 99 cents is almost an immediate purchase. Right? Because it's like, well, if I don't really like it, it, was, it cost me now 30 bucks instead of whatever, a million dollars. Um, it depends on the app though, really. So 299, 399, 499, it really depends upon what it's going to do. If it's only going to do one thing, yeah, okay, it's fine. It's a multiplication app. I'm probably going to go free or 99 cents, right? But uh, it really depends upon, you know, like uh, the Apple uh, pages of numbers. Those are 10 bucks. Those make us pause. Don't 999? Not sure. If it were 499, no problem, right? Because of the power of that, because of what it does. So there is a sliding scale, and, and teachers, like I said, we don't manage that, so they make their own choices. On so there's, there's no district vetting process, or you know, no? Or it actually or? it's worked out better not to. So we have there's a site that are, there have some vetted apps for teachers, but it's actually better to have to let them choose their own because they don't feel like the district is controlling them. They're actually choosing what they think is best for their grade level. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Sure. Great is job. there a uh, database or kickback from what they've learned, you know, so you're not, the, the teachers are, have a personal learning curve, but it's uh, coming back so the other teachers learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're actually, so we're submitting now our apps to Oakland and uh, Southern California School District. They've set up, a, and it's on our wiki site, so if you go to our wiki site, you'll see their links. They've set up a, a Google spreadsheet that's sort of a why I want math, fourth grade, and 99 cents or less. It's a great live on sharing ideas about what apps are good, what features they like to see in the comments. So yeah, it's very important. Cool. Yeah, so I, um, one big concern, I'm a developer, one big concern, and a certified teacher, English teacher, um, one big concern I have is uh, what we've heard about happening in Korea. You know, Korea is the most unwired society in the world, and we're seeing, there's research coming out about how people there are, interactions, interpersonal interactions are dropping, like the quality of like, people's emotional intelligence, quality of their life is dropping because they're learning how to communicate text. And so I'm wondering if you, if, if, if you guys have any thoughts about how the technology here can actually be used to facilitate better communication, better social interactions. I love the example that you had about the, uh, about the app for students who haven't been able to speak, but I'm wondering if you, if you guys have seen other examples of that or have other ideas about how we use this as a way to facilitate better uh, interpersonal relationships. So in third grade, every kid has cooties. Right? You got cooties, you got cooties, you got cooties, you got, cooties, you got cooties. And what we're seeing in these little classrooms and even younger and older kids is that they'll tech support each other. And so you'll have a special ed kid working with and helping with an ELL kid and an English language learner kid or the other way around. And so across gender, across the normal lines, across the kid who might, they'll help each other. So there's this kind of crazy, and it's, I don't want to use the word because it's kind of a really useful word. It's magical in some ways to watch some of this stuff happen. Because there are things that you don't expect. And every time I, I go over to this elementary school, I walk in and I go, oh my god, look at that. That's the coolest thing ever. They're sitting on the floor. She wants to get rid of all the furniture now because they're just doing all the work. You can go to the extreme. But <coughs> it's good. Yeah, they are kind of interesting. It's two or three. So a lot of, there's a lot, in some ways, a lot more social interaction. Plus they're blogging on, we have an internal blog server that they use for uh, <coughs> their responses to what they're reading. And then they can read each other to comment on them. And then, of course, they're in the same classroom. So, We've talked about it. I've written some stuff up there. Hey, thanks for the props. That was great. Um, and it happens at kind of all the levels. So watch them. They actually interact more. And I think, seriously, that that division of the screen not there any longer makes a big difference. And that picture, you see them leaning in. We're seeing the kids interacting in a different way and sharing more. And the teachers are interacting. Back to your comment about the teachers are the gatekeeper. They are. You know, we've got teachers who are non-technical. Gal is very retired. Deanna Calcano, actually. Uh, been in education 34 years, and she goes, Best, best fun I've had teaching in 25 years. I was ready to quit, and I'm never going to get to me. And you can have the iPod back, and you cry for my cold, dead hands. <laughs> <laughs> and I think she was serious, which is pretty cantankerous. It's my extreme. I get it. Deanna would love you. Um, <laughs> keep the up. That's right. No, she, she has a whole classroom set. So she's seeing social things. These teachers are meeting together in different ways that haven't been done before. You can't buy that kind of professional. So there's a there are multiple social facets to that. And in the back there. Hi, uh, I'm actually actually the same question. We're pulling on the edges of two different dimensions or two different um, axes. I'm curious about uh, what this gentleman brought up about the Koreans. If there's a cultural element there, if if we're slanted towards sort of an American way of interacting or American way of teaching, and if there are any um, cultural implications or language implications that are going to change the relationship to the interface. And then the second part of that is shifting to a different age group. I'm 
I'm wondering if there's a required brain squishing this portion that still has to exist for people to grasp the learning this way, and their brain still has to be malleable enough to do that. Or because I'm thinking in terms of you know taking these models into a continued education or a, an enterprise environment where people are learning um, new new tasks or new skills, and whether that's going to change some of the settings. Okay, so let's start with the last question first. Uh, Mark Prinsky wrote, wrote a few articles recently about neuroplasticity. Oh, yeah. and about Can you talk a little slower and a little louder? Sorry. So Mark Prinsky wrote some articles on uh, neuroplasticity, and of course it's not his research, it's somebody else's research, but that the brain can still learn to learn even further in. You have to practice more because you're not used to practicing because you get in a rut and you do it the same way every time. So I'm not too worried about that. I think that there are some... I think there's some exciting things in watching a nine-year-old lady writing poetry on her iPad you know, on a YouTube video. Um, I spoke, I was in China um, about eight months ago, nine months ago, and I spoke at a mobile uh, education learning uh, thing, and there was a lot of concern because of the control issues around content, right? So all these mobile devices, that that's cool, but we're not gonna go there. Um, and then we talked about, you know, so if it's all electronic, what happens if uh, the school laboratories get flooded with the river? And, I, and then I asked, how many people in this room have a, have a, a mobile phone? And every, every kid and every professor raised their hands. There's your platform, right? You have to start thinking about how you deliver content across something small, portable, and that every kid, at least in this room, can afford. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of cultural. We look at things that explore, we're creative, we like to play with the information, morph it, uh, and it was a different look. They said, well, how do you, if it's not linear, I don't understand how you do content on this thingy, right? So that was a, that was a big cultural moment for me. I was like, well, okay, that's right, I have to think about it. So yes, I think there's some American-ist culture around it. But, um, and Corey, I actually want to sort of take that question for you and then work with the textbook publishers. They're a very interesting entity. Uh, how much do they are willing to let go of control in terms of, yes, you might have a textbook that has 12 chapters, but really waking up the idea that people are going to want to mix and match or change the order or sequence or add their own you know, content to them? Well, I, think they, I think they'd be amenable to that, so long as we could find some revenue stream. <laughs> some <laughs> yeah. In the with that. Yeah, exactly. So, like, you swipe your card. And, right, your yeah. No, I think they're okay with that. I think the, the biggest thing they're squirrely about is premier content. So you know, the, 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 when they have this content that they paid a lot for, like this, this anatomy uh, thing we're doing is based on the Flash um, tool they already have, and they invested a lot in that. So it's considered premier content. So you can't just throw it on an iPad and, and let anybody do what they want with it and start mixing it around. So I think there is some proprietary feelings about the content um, to some extent. But I think that they're, they're, they're willing to play now. But you know, both of those questions brought something up, um, and I have an answer to both of those, and it's I don't know. Um, it's a good, I think, it's a good scientific answer. Um, just anthropologically speaking, um, I just don't, I, I think a whole new world of research is going to grow up around the spreading of these devices and how they're used. Um, and I think it needs to, it's just going to happen. I, I, I'm positive I could take a, an app made for educating um, college students here and have it just work anywhere. I wouldn't exactly be very surprised. That would be a paper in its own right. Like, wow, it's, all of anthropology is wrong. <laughs> Give my degree back. But I think actually that we, we need to study these things and see how it's affecting society when everybody's um, on wireless devices and communicating that way. And how we can actually you know, educate the world using mobile platforms. Well, how do we, how do we actually get across that divide? And I, I think it's, I don't know, and I think that's, we're going to have to find out. When I was at that Untethered thing, um, which is just a second, let me talk about me just a little bit more. <laughs> I was at that Untethered thing, uh, there was a guy there from Hewlett Packard, I forgot his name, but he was a fascinating talk. He was talking about how they've been doing research around the world um, of people using touch devices, and how he noticed the touch expectations of people in different cultures were different. Where they were given a picture, they didn't expect to pinch it to make it small. <laughs> they didn't expect to do this to make it bigger. They had a turning uh, things in mind. So he was talking about maybe there being these sort of nascent touch dialects out there that exist that need to be studied. That's really cool. Right? Touch dialects. Touche. Um, I have a question for Joe, but I did want to comment about this cultural thing. Um, there was a book called iBrain saying that brain scans of our younger generation look different because their social skills are less. It's for PCs. For those of you who are interested, that's a really interesting book. Um, Joe, the statistics 
aspects in the pie charts you showed are just astonishing. I mean, if that, I mean, they seem to suggest that we could achieve um, no child left behind. To what extent can this be replicated across the country? Because if it can be, this would be the biggest story of the century. Okay. Well, first of all, um, no device will make a bad teacher any better. So, some of these teachers, of course, are some better ones. But what has happened, and this is, we're going to go into the big deployment this year. We're not everybody's totally on board. Um, but what's happened in the classrooms here are two pieces of engagement. Number one, the student engagement. You know, when you go to school and power down, school sucks, right? Because I can do all this other stuff for my other 18 hours. I go in and spend six hours in hell school, and then I leave, and I go back into my world. And so I think that some of that reaching and trying to bridge those two things has created a large student engagement. Um, one of the survey I've got, the data is actually on the wiki, and there's a lot more data slides I've cut down. Um, but one of the slides that, that one of the teachers has t taken data from her students, and the interesting one, so it shows, you know, I read for longer, yes, or I do this other stuff, sort of. But the one slide that really stuck out at 85, 90% of her class said, uh, listening to myself read, practicing reading, and listening to myself, my own voice reading, makes me want to be a better reader. So now they've created a desire to get better because they can hear themselves and the mistakes they make and practice. So there's a student engagement. The other part of that, the other side of the part is the teacher engagement. So I'm seeing these people get fired up. These are professionals that do their thing, and they're pretty good teachers, but they're sharing with each other. And when their kids do a better job of tests, because unfortunately we're measured by these things, right? Uh, but they get engaged even more so. They go, oh, hey, that's great. My kids just did better. And they come across, I'm going to brag. I got four kids. Only four kids didn't pass the reading assessment. I have the lowest kids in the universe. This is great. Um, so I think those two things are like that. Um, Sometimes people ask, and I've been contacted about, they want to do, you know, iPods for every kid today. Well, they haven't laid the groundwork either. This is year three for us. We have some excitement around it. Um, and I think that we're going to see even more of those things. But the simple pedagogical things still stay in place. Um, teachers working with kids, having lots of practice. You know, one of my failures as a teacher, I taught high school Spanish for 10 years or so, um, was getting feedback to the students, because I had 225 kids every single day. Turn in one paper. 225 times 5, more than 1,000. Guess what? Round file. Or uh, two weeks later, here's your paper from two weeks ago. I can't remember yesterday what we went to the problem with, right? So what's nice about some of the features of the device is we use a lot of the recording of the voice. It's immediate feedback right there. I just heard myself. I just said it correctly or not correctly. Um, that's huge for us. The, lang the, the apps that are multilingual, we have all kinds of languages. Now, Camp is mostly just Spanish, but also some Russian and some other things. But, you know, apps that are multilingual, it just hooks the kid in. So there's this engagement piece that's really hard to study. Um, there are studies, but there aren't very many studies about engagement. So is it scalable? Yeah, I think it is scalable, but it has to be kind of methodical. Can I ask him a question? You get 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to say six words. <laughs> uh, what Do you see that um, maybe a lot of the success is from there being a wow factor? Yeah. Uh, 10 years from now, it won't be as engaged by the technology. You know, I, I thought so. So, yes and no. Um, and part of that doesn't bother me. If I'm going to take test scores, I'm going to go from 30% at fourth grade passes to 70%, I'll cost them 29 dollars earbuds. So, I'll take it, right? But um, what's happened now is we've got uh, PTAs who bought 60 iPods for one of the elementaries because the kids were in Julie's class two years ago in third grade. And then they helped get some more iPods for the fourth grade. And there's no way in hell my kid is not going to go fifth grade or not without an iPod. Right? <laughs> right? And I'm not kidding. And then they lay out 20,000 bucks from carnival money that they've earned if they put this thing they're going to buy 60 iPods. And what I think they've seen is their kids engage in school in a different way. And so is there a wow factor? Yeah, but there's 270 some thousand apps. So I got a new app. I got a new wow factor. You know, a new one this week. I got a new one this week. And Trina, what are you seeing from the higher education students who read, which I know are kind of unique? Uh, I am one too. Uh, but what's their reaction? I mean, what, from the Kindle experience or for just being this iPad? Right. They're very skeptical. They really are. They're extremely skeptical. They were, I mean, we were a little bit surprised that we got almost, I think we got almost 100% participation rate in the Kindle study already because they're very protective of their experience mm -hmm. and they have a very specific idea of it. And so, <coughs> sort of, I was like, of course, wanting to replicate everything they really, really like already about their books. So, they have, they come to it with a lot of skepticism. They're not particularly open, but that makes them a really good gauge of what actually works, you know. And, and is the pilot open to new students or just the students who are in the Kindle? Um, this is actually, it's going to be a totally different group of students. Totally it's going to be
be a, the same class, but you know, a new year. So yeah, okay. similar students, but not the same. Over here, but yeah. So we're about to release an app into the app that's an education app. You can use a tremendous app. But there's you know 150,000 competitors, right? So specifically in terms of marketing, what can we do to get this noticed, right? Well, take Joe's data. <laughs> yeah, right. So, 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 so we may ask to borrow that. <laughs> License it. <laughs> well, it depends on what kind of app it is. And so there are professional organizations that are starting to get fired up on this. So the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese might be a place if you were going to do a language learning app. Um, because some teachers will subscribe to that. Um, a lot of it is um, noise out there or an ad, you know, some, some of say, hey, I got this great app by now. So sometimes finding out which districts are doing these things and then targeting specifically, hey, we got this little app that you like a free download or over try it out or whatever. Um, it's, it's really hard because they get discovered but based upon sometimes upon their description. The better description you have in the iTunes store, sometimes that's itself. Feature set, feature set, feature set, great screenshots. That looks okay. So it's it's a uh, that's the most difficult market. We'll take all your free notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the iEar iEar.org is that the uh, no uh, that iEar does do a review and it does get um, it gets quite a bit of play at iEar. Right. So that's that's a good one. iEar.org. But that's the that's one place. And the guy right here. Okay. Well, along the similar lines, and I think Joe, you might be the best person to ask this question, but if any of you have experience with it, um, you know, this the, the Wired article recently about the death of the web um, that everybody doesn't like, but kind of might be true. Um, <laughs> um, the people that are making the buying decisions about these apps are they thinking primarily in terms of apps and going directly to the app store? Are they open to other things like web services, web apps, and that sort of thing? wondering what you think about that. They want it to work. And so they're not really totally, um, it just depends, it depends on the, on the service, right? Uh, they use apps in some ways because they're simple. Home button, next app, launch code. Um, but really, and it depends, you know, every district's a little bit different. So some buying decisions are made by higher ups, some are made by curriculum departments, some are made by teachers in the classroom. Um, but if you have a compelling enough service or app or what have you, people will buy it. Right, so if it's doing what they want it to do, um, like I said, that some people will buy three or four multiplication apps, where each one does something a little bit different, and I want, I want, I want to do this on Tuesday and this on Thursday. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but services are paid for. Dropbox has become this huge thing, right? It was just kind of this cutesy deal, and guess what? It's mission critical for a lot of people I know, uh, myself included. I think, I think I'm mostly just wondering, you know, the, the, the app store is such a really easy experience. You just go, pay for it, it's done, right? You know, and then you can give it to a whole bunch of people. Right. Um, <laughs> um, you know, web apps are not as regular. You have their different payment methods and stuff like that. And I'm just wondering if, in your experience, you're finding people that are having trouble with understanding, you know, go to this URL, you know, tell everybody go to this URL, to use the service, and, you know, different payment methods and stuff like that, or is that? store really just so easy that they're just all using that? Uh, the app store is the easiest method. Yeah. You know, along those lines, just from a developer standpoint, I think you can do um, you can do more powerful things than using the iOS sure. oftentimes than you can using the web. So the kind of stuff we want to deliver is just be better to make it with the iOS and go through the store. And it's easier for my clients to monetize the situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of folks well, are that way. So, yeah. I just bought the Green Eggs and Ham. That's
you, Corey, I, you, you touched on it a little bit, but if you could get down to like one thing or a phrase or something, make it simple, what was the one thing that didn't work and then the two did? Does that, does that make sense? Well, yeah, for us it's very simple. The technology made the students' lives harder and less good instead of making their lives easier and better. So. <laughs> yeah. Was, that, was there fear with the professor? I mean, like, I don't really understand this. I made the comment a couple of times. We could make this be the same thing that we taught for X amount of years. You it's, know what I mean? We could. I mean, there's a certain amount of skepticism toward the whole process, but I think these, these are people who very well understood sort of what they were getting into and were willing to make a number of concessions and made a whole lot of concessions throughout the semester and still were disappointed and said, look, this isn't good enough. The students aren't learning as well as they do otherwise. And that just wasn't acceptable. Um, our method was covert operations. <laughs> don't ask if you don't want to answer, you don't want to hear. And choose a rock star. So for us, we chose somebody who was a good teacher who didn't mind things maybe not always working. Um, and then we didn't, well, we, I didn't really ask anybody. We just sort of kind of did it, see what would happen. I talked to the principal. By the way, we'll be in your classroom tomorrow. I don't know if you know that's coming in. Because um, <laughs> we had a little bit of R&D funding, just a little bit. So we were able to put something in there. Let's see what happens. And let's take some data. And as soon as we took some data, we tried it out with somebody who could make it work, took some data. And of course, her data is going to be much more done than somebody else's because she's already a good teacher. Um, and then after I had that stuff, I said, mm, by the way, I'd like to kind of maybe do a few more. Uh, the other thing we had going um, was that we have an innovation grant that teachers can apply for for up to $2,000 in classroom technology, not including a projector or a computer or just, you know, stupid stuff like that, fun stuff. Um, and so that really helped drive it because teachers have to make some choices on their own. And a lot of them, after year one, chose iPod Touch, iPod Nanos. So they were driving it. So all of a sudden, all of our schools had a bunch of iPod things happening as well as an official what happening, pilot in the middle of it, and then it became hard to ignore. So that's kind of how we got to this place. Um, but we started out with covert and stuff. Any last question there? Uh, I think one of the things as an instructor that seems to be the most powerful about the new technological world that we live in, like classroom 2.0 is really about students connecting with each other collaborating and then authoring their own stuff. Like I'm not really interested in an app that delivers textbook information. I think it's great, and in some ways that may meet some learning styles better. But I wonder, and like I have students like the Reed students, probably, I'm guessing we have very similar kinds of students in my, uh, the place where I work is very conservative in that way also in terms of we love our books and we have small classes and we sit and we talk, but the thing that happens in the classroom now is that maybe that conversation is outside the room also. So I'm curious if the three of you see somehow mobile technology helping us with that as opposed to like, bringing us more content in new and creative ways, which is great, but somehow also empowering students to connect with each other in new ways uh, outside of the classroom time and then create their own stuff. I know they can do that already with the web and, and they can do it in many ways, but can they do it in a, a mobile way? You know, at Exprima, that's the holy grail. That's what we're after. That's sort of what was on the whiteboard a few years ago that started this whole thing. Some kind of, that school without walls, where it's actually students, the school without walls isn't about textbook publishers delivering stuff. And it's about students being able to really form these extra classroom communities. Um, and so in my case, it's just not happening right now because my clients, textbook publishers, needed to take this baby step towards that. And all the apps that we're making for them I'm leaving room in the design for that. It's always in the discussion about, and wouldn't it be cool now if students could share ideas and create this? But they're not ready for that step, so I'm in sort of the baby steps mode. Now that being said, I'd love to make an app or a, a, an app type environment where students could do that independently of textbook publishers. So if you have venture capital, want to give that to me. It's, cool. it's, cool. it's part of the master plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's, uh, before we thank the panelists, uh, I'm sure they'll stick around just a little bit more if we want to cover them with more questions. Mm -hmm. Jason, what's the usual protocol for this? Did we go, did drink more, or is it just, you know? So, uh, <laughs> Can't go so first, I, I want to thank Thor and um, all the panelists for coming. This has been a great session.
questions. Um, there is normally a movement after Mobile Portland meetings to retire to somewhere like Deschutes Brewery for drinks and some food afterwards. Um, for those of us who have drank too much, it might be good to have some food. Um, so uh, that is an option as well. Um, and it sounds like Thor is leading the charge in that way. Um, we will be here the fourth Monday of every month. So the fourth Monday in September, um, we will be here talking about mobile. Uh, I'm not exactly certain. We're either going to be talking about web analytics or talking about Windows Phone. I'm not sure which yet. Um, or mobile analytics, I should say, actually. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you all for coming very much. It's great to have you.